Drew. Please, uh, and and then uh, we'll open it up. And since Jack mentioned his name, I, I'd like to first thank Jake Saul for uh, putting this panel together, although I, I wasn't sure I was going to thank him after I enjoyed the experience. But, uh, but it was his idea, and I, even though he's not here, I thank him for that. And I thank the participants who each, in their own way, know certain components of this book better than I ever will. Um, Michelle knows the Roman Republic and uh, ancient Rome uh, better than I ever will. Uh, Jules and Mark know more about Florentine politics, uh, medieval and Renaissance than I ever will. And Jack certainly knows more about the American founding uh, than I ever will. So it's, it's a daunting task uh, to face uh, such critics. Uh, and I, I appreciate their uh, incisive comments uh, and their generosity uh, as well. And Michelle, of course, started out by having me pegged about uh, the rhetorical legitimacy of the past. Why does one go back to the past? Why make this conservative move when the intention is clearly not conservative? And uh, she exposes that quite well. Uh, one can better uh, introduce more radical uh, innovations, ideas, by cloaking them uh, in uh, the past. And uh, do we need another uh, exposition by a Marxist academic, or Zizek, or Rancière, or what the latest flavor of radical theory is to say that capitalism is bad, and it leads to equality, and it creates uh, power asymmetries? Or do we want to turn to someone who knew a little bit about politics, uh, maybe someone who knew uh, more about politics than anyone else, such as Machiavelli, uh, who drew upon a very robust, if tested uh, form of government in, in Rome, in the Roman Republic, to uh, disquisition on politics generally. So there is that legitimacy, I think, by going back to an author who understood politics, practiced politics, maybe didn't get the opportunity that Madison is to, to fully uh, experience it as much as he would have liked, um, and to go back to real practices, real institutions um, that to some extent, worked well in the past, so that there, there was that, that goal in turning to Machiavelli and Machiavelli's Rome. Uh, on Michelle's point about, which I take, I take very seriously, uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, she doesn't think I engaged in distortion, but she does think I engaged in refraction uh, in, in turning to Machiavelli's text, in turning to the, the discourses, and that um, there's nothing that's not there uh, that I say is there in Machiavelli, but that in some sense I make uh, democracy explicit where it's more latent in, in Machiavelli's text. And I think that's true to a certain extent, but I also want to emphasize how radical the book is even on its surface. And I think that uh, this is something that by putting Machiavelli in the context of uh, the conservative Republicans he was speaking with at the time, um, we get to highlight, we get to cast the relief <coughs> just how radical were his endorsements of the Roman Tribune, just how radical were his endorsement of the Citizen Army, uh, and just how endorsement, uh, just how radical was his endorsement of assemblies where the people uh, actually speak and decide uh, as a citizenry. And th those things were offensive, obnoxious to the Otomati of his day, to the, the young Otomati to whom he dedicated the book, to his friend and interlocutor Francesco Guicciardini. And so I think I think almost there was a surface radicality and, and democratic quality to the discourses that I think Machiavelli read in isolation. Uh, uh, you don't see in, in him. So, so, but there is Michelle's correct. Uh, I'm drawing actually a lot more out of the text than than just that um, about the contemporary relevance of the book. And I, I think this is I think the single Michelle has put her finger on the single most non-translatable aspect of Machiavelli's politics for our own, and that is the place of violence, in particular death, uh, as a means of political punishment. Uh, and Machiavelli thinks that uh, this is indispensable. If one is, to, if one is to keep, if one is to control the insolent, the in, unquenchably uh, ambitious and greedy, predominantly those who have the desire to oppress, the only, the only punishment to stop them is, is execution. He knew from his long experience in Florence that exile doesn't work. 
history of exiles in Florence is um, a very unfortunate series of episodes because they always come back. Uh, and one of the things he says, the Romans do, uh, is that uh, it's best not to let them come back. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't tell you that Coriolanus got away and, and led an army against Rome, but, but he would have you believe that uh, from his exposition that Coriolanus was, was executed. Um, so there, there is this, this element that I think uh, Michelle is right in saying that we, we pull back from the idea of punishing uh, our political uh, criminals and that we may even, even given our own milieu, we may uh, create empathy or sympathy for them if we were to put them on trial before, before the people. So I, I think that's a, a very serious gap between Machiavelli's day and ours. Um, another contemporary problem Michelle points out is the passivity of modern citizenship, citizenship in the United States, citizenship in capitalist democracies. Um, and that this was something that Livy was dealing with in his time, and it was also something Machiavelli was dealing with in his time. And as I engage Mark's comments, I think I'll address how Machiavelli thought he might uh, overcome passivity and create energy among, among citizens. So uh, Mark's comments were, you know, I almost want to say I, I agree with with everything uh, that, that he says. Um, I appreciate his emphasis on Machiavelli's counterintuitive strategy to use formal inequality to undermine substantive inequality. In other words, you improve uh, the lot of poorer citizens by actually excluding them from some offices and granting to them exclusively some other offices. In other words, by making them formally unequal than you do by making them equal and eligible for, for all offices, and that this works in two ways. One, they can further their own agenda through those institutions, but it also works in a socio-cultural <coughs> way that it creates anger and indignation among them about, wait a minute, I thought this is a race publica. I thought that we are all common. We are, we are all part of the public thing. <coughs> Why do we have less formal power than these other, than these other uh, political actors? This is a comune. Why, why, I thought we share politics in common and it makes them angry and agitated and it makes them focus and be interested in politics more than they are when their interests are supposedly taken care of uh, by their elected representatives or their, or their betters. Um, one thing, however, I'm not sure that Machiavelli in his constitutional proposal for Florence wanted to consign uh, <coughs> Roman law lower guildsmen, uh, Florentine lower guildsmen, from never attaining uh, the Signoria again. I think we can see, if we look at his uh, account of Rome, we can see him praise the fact that the Roman plebeians were initially excluded from the consulship, and this made them want it. Uh, it creates an agitation and motivation for them to, to seek to attain it, and then they do attain it, and Machiavelli praises that, and that, that that's a good thing, and I think that uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Machiavelli, despite the fact that he's recommending that initially there be an exclusion from lower guildsmen from the Signoria in his constitutional proposal, that he wouldn't over, over time expect them to actually gain it back. Uh, so that in the end, I think Machiavelli prefers a Republican model or a democracy that includes the people in ineligibility for all offices, but he maintains exclusion from the wealthy from some other offices. So in the end, it's only the wealthy who are excluded from some offices and not, not the poor. Um, Mark, of course, points on the major difference between Rome and Florence, the socio-economic cultural difference, which drove Machiavelli crazy. And that is the multi-party, multi-class uh, character of Florentine politics. Uh, as opposed to the natural, what he calls the natural class contentiousness of the Roman Republic, where you have the, the Grandi versus the Popolo, these two opposite humors. In, in Florence, it seems like there, there, there isn't this natural uh, opposition, and Machiavelli attributes this to, as, as Mark mentions, clientelism. Now, if you read Machiavelli, you wouldn't know that the Romans invented the term, uh, well, the practice, you think that there was no clientelism in Rome, but he attributes clientelism to something that we modern republics have, that
that you have uh, lower guildsmen basically co-opted by, by their wealthy patrons. Um, but this is part of a broad, Machiavelli, I think, thinks clientelism can be overcome if you adopt his number one goal, the four institutional goals, the number one goal is arming the people. So that if you convert Florence from a commercial republic into a martial republic and you arm all the people, you will then set in motion uh, the social energy by which the common people will then ask for the institutional uh, reforms, perhaps attributed, perhaps lottery, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that ancient republics had. And so, but of course, this goal was something that Machi, however open his aristocratic audience might have been to some of his institutional prescriptions, Machiavelli's career, of course, shows that he was uh, shut down whenever he proposed uh, a general militia for Florence, and the you know, Machiavelli constantly uh, watered down his proposals to make it a, a very, a very big citizen, citizen army. 